Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Paul, for the very uh, generous introduction, and thank you all for being with me today. And it's really, truly a great pleasure and honor to visit uh, Moran uh, University of Utah, where we, I would like to share uh, uh, the research discovery at my uh, laboratory, uh, at my independent laboratory at UCSF in the past seven years. <clears throat> so, uh, so as Paul just introduced, uh, uh, my training background is purely in development, development biology, and development neurobiology. Uh, so by putting this very long title uh, in front of all of you, you may get confused. Uh, why, you know, does all the ophthalmology need to care about all the foreign terms and like in terms of what's 3D, what's PSA2, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is not the purpose to confuse you rather than just update you on what we really learned from a basic discovery perspective, how we understand the eye, the retina as an integral piece. I hope this presents one of the first uh, uh, direct evidence on several of the new information that I would like to share with you today. And all this um, published and coming out in press, so uh, I welcome all the critics and uh, discussions. And I think that's uh, the beauty of this uh, uh, visit uh, in, instead of just reading the papers. Huh? <clears throat> to get started, I'd like to get, give you a brief introduction on what uh, I've been doing at my uh, lab in the past seven years. So briefly, uh, you know, this is a very, uh, you know, overarching goal of the Duan Laboratory at UCSF, where our focus is really to use a developmental and genetics approach to understand how our uh, different neurons are wired together. And the central challenge, as you heard from all the APARH, uh, you know, the, all, the, uh, all the grand scheme, and one of the major challenges that we have been doing in the past 10 years is really understand the mechanism to connect the eyes to the brain and also in the degeneration and the regeneration setting, how to utilize the information we gathered from development uh, from all the new technology to connect the eye, reconnect the eye to the brain. And particularly my focus has been the neural retina, uh, while many of you probably be busy with how the rest of the piece of the eye to be connected back, transplanted back to the body. So the approach we have been taking is really the following way. It's a very reductionist approach you know, for those of you who are physicians and ophthalmologists, basically this sounds like a little bit too naive and too, um, um, there's a message, okay. Uh -huh. To, uh, I'm sorry, are we still on full screen? We're good there. Yeah? So to take a genetic approach, to really to uh, start to understand how different pieces of the eye neurons are really uh, being uh, developed and grow and connected. So I'm gonna get into a lot of details in this lecture and the second half of this lecture on this particular approach. You know, like when I, when I walked in, I saw this, uh, you know, Maria Capacci Drive, uh, you know, this really big sign there. So this is a, the pioneer, the giant who really uh, make this possible, really using the mouse as a model organism and using the uh, traditional mouse genetic approach to understand how the different blocks of the body is being built. And we are just very luxurious and fortunate to uh, do the same effort uh, in different part of the eyes. And, and beyond that is once we have different building blocks, given the recent technology started with you know, all the RNA-seq, and most recently you probably overheard this again and again in terms of the single cell RNA-seq. So, how can we take advantage of this and discover and rediscover different factors that might be involved in the growth, in the regrowth, and in the cell-cell contact? And that is really one of the um, uh, core strengths that my labor laboratory has been building uh, in, the, <coughs> uh, in the past few years. So for those of you who may come to the noon lecture, this has, uh, this, I'll show you more of the exercise in that way. But in the end, this is a technology that comes hand in hand with single cell, uh, with genetics, really trying to understand the different part of the cells. And last but not least, when we have different pieces together, but one of the core uh, uh, interest, one of the focus, is are we really putting the things back to the uh, back to the original structure? By regrowing the synapses, regrowing the axons, do we really form the functional synapses? Especially with the central challenge from the eye to the brain, what would be the effective and precise approach? Uh, to understand this. So this has been the, uh, the, uh, one of the uh, focus, building upon the first two aims, where my laboratory really dived in 
and establish several uh, new approaches that integrate the techniques above to do the um, uh, to do the research uh, f forward. And for those of you who come to the noon lectures, and I will focus on the, uh, the second and third piece of it. Okay, so to move back to the eye, to really focus on the, uh, the morning lecture, especially for those of you who really focus what's going on in the eyes. And this is really our, um, our, our stars here. So given this audience, and I put this beautiful slide uh, uh, sketched out by uh, Dr. Rachel Wong at UW, we're, uh, we can start to use the mouse eye as a vertical section, you know, like the 2020 approach, where we can really look into different pieces using a high resolution microscopy. Uh, given uh, Ning and David's uh, work here in this institute, I don't think this needs too much of an introduction, rather than telling you that this is a very beautiful structure within the inner retina, where we do have a, a laminated structure um, where the interneurons and different type of ganglion cells really uh, form the uh, very stereotypical connections. So for those of you who do not think about this in a daily basis, why do we care about this? So a short answer to that is by understanding this highly stereotypical structures, especially the contact, the synapses, uh, render this individual cells and circuits, each and every one of these types of neurons in the eye will represent the features such as direction, such as motion, such as color and adaptation from the processing of the inner retina to the rest of the eye, to the rest of the brain. So in other words, by understanding the complexity of the ganglion cells and the inner circuit, inner retina circuits associated with that, we may have a really a piecemeal approach to understand how our central vision is generated. And I'm going to give you a few examples uh, as this lecture grow, goes forward. <clears throat> so much of this, uh, the focus of this, the development of this, uh, has been published during the postdoctoral training and also continuously at my own laboratories in the past few years where we try to use the genetic approach and focus on a family of molecules called the cadetherins and understand how the synapses are being built and mediated by cell-cell recognition. For those of you who are interested in the published work, feel free to refer to these references uh, that I'm going to, uh, I wouldn't have time to go into details. But the take home message is by understanding individual building pieces, we do have a, recon a reconstruction of the entire circuit from pre-stepped neurons to the post-stepped neurons. Taking the same approach, when I introduced you in the developmental setting, we have been particularly interested in the topics of the neural protections and optic nerve growth. So you'll find it interesting and amused that by understanding different pieces, we started to expand this uh, uh, Alice, this uh, reference book, over and over again, subject to models such as optic nerve crush, basically it's the axon injuries, or most recently, the, uh, uh, the silicon oil-mediated uh, uh, glycomatous uh, models. By repeating the work in terms of in, in the injury approach, our laboratory has been uh, extending the work of genetic marking of the neuron during development in the adult setting by understanding the principles of the cell growth and re uh, synapse formation in the regenerative settings. So to make a, a very long story short and to oversimplify by telling you what's going on, that essentially we discover a very small subset of neurons in the mouse retina that is roughly uh, five to eight percent of neurons represent the most robust regrowth and regenerative abilities. So we went in using the mouse genetic approach to mark individual cells and compare them and also take the traditional uh, uh, fact sorting sing uh, RNA-seq approach, not the single cell approach, to understand the intrinsic mechanism. And we uh, have discovered an uh, intrinsic factor in this regenerative molecules, uh, in regenerative cells called osteopontin, uh, SPP1, that enriched in the alpha cells, where we were able to re uh, put this back in the regeneration settings and understand how the individual cell respond to injuries and most recently to glycomatous conditions. And all those also got recently published and renewed uh, from the postdoc training. So for those of you who are interested in this set of work, 
um, I would like to uh, refer you to these references. And also for those of you who are coming to talk with me after this, I'm happy to discuss all this uh, published data. Okay, so uh, given this very precious opportunities to talk with you in the next uh, 30, 40 minutes, I would like to share uh, unpublished work that's brand new, but also building, on same, building upon the same concepts. And for those of you who uh, got fascinated by the cell type, the cell type discoveries, I would argue all this was done and belonged to my postdoctoral fellow, uh, postdoctoral mentors. But what's really new here is what we can use this system to understand the fundamental biology in development uh, with the old outlook into the, uh, into the eye diseases. So that's the beginning of this. So let's relook at these pictures and really by focusing on how this structure is beautifully organized. And for those of you who are like, uh, are like a, 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 you know, gurus into this, the text, into the taxonomy of the cells, you'll be able to tell you know, this direction, that direction, so on and so forth. However, I want to emphasize on the development, basically by understanding how this structure is being built. In reality, the mouse offers a beautiful system to understand this structure because all these structures are born and developed postnatally. Thus offers us a prime opportunity to observe this with the systems of the mouse genetics and the viruses to see the entire growth and synapse formation. So when we focus on these pieces of the, uh, uh, the tissue, and I would like to also bring your attention uh, to uh, uh, a mirror image, which is organized in a beautiful manner, simultaneously in the same dimension, and that is really the beautiful vasculature of the, uh, in, the ret in the retina. So for, uh, I understand there is a great interest in understanding the vascular, uh, vasculation, vasculation uh, with this audience, so why do we care about this? You know, you can always argue there's VEGF, there's efferens, there's hypoxia. So I would like to argue by referring to a lot of the pioneer work, what we understand is by now two-dimensional growth, really a gradient media growth. However, when we look into the inner retina, what makes the retina, the brain, in terms of vasculature different from liver, from tumor, is really the beautifully organized tissue and organization of the vasculature in vivo. So this is something I learned uh, throughout the uh, process. Given any eye neurons, in the same way as the brain neurons in the mammalian world, including mouse and human, any neuron is within the distance of 20, mi 20 micron of a vasculature. That lattice organization ensured very even and the gradient distribution of the oxygen, of the nutrients to the rest of the nervous system. This is you know, the classic knowledge of the uh, neurovascular interaction and also vessel feeding back to the neurons and particularly focused on the inner retina. And what I haven't told you is when you look at these images, this entire growth process all accomplished simultaneously postnatally with the first week being the the so-called the uh, superficial layer where the two-dimensional migration happened. And the mystery to grow from the inner retina inward, you know, for those of you who are vascular biologists, this is outward, where it really go to penetrate, establish this additional deep layer and middle layer. And this happened at the same time with our neurodevelopment. There are several hypotheses to make if you think about the development approach. Is it really the interaction of the neurons on this side guide this? Are there certain gradients from the inner retina that guide the migration? Or there's some different approaches. When I described you the timing, the geographic location, and the cell cell interaction, this really got me fascinated. And we took several approaches uh, early on when we first started build tools, uh, including ablations and so on and so forth. And that wasn't effective. Basically, we were not able to use this reduction approach to perturb the inner retina uh, vasculature. It took me a few years to come back to visit this and purely by accident. So basically what we want to understand is, are there any potential interaction that mediate this structure formation, especially in the third dimension in a highly stereotypical manner? So uh, six years forward, uh, at the beginning of my uh, laboratory. So a very talented postdoc, Kenichi Toma, uh, was trying to establish a non-invasive approach 
to mark and manipulate ions in vivo. So we were very inspired by the gene therapies that a lot of people started to do, especially in a mammalian setting, where uh, scientists started to do this retroorbital pathway of AAV delivery, basically in injection, a uh, high volume injection into the sinus that allow the vascular uh, circulation to occur. And this offers a prime opportunity to look into the vascular neural interaction because everything goes through the circulation, including the whole body, including the whole brain, is introduced in this sinus. So surprisingly, not many people use this approach to study the retina systematically. So we decided to take this task and did the following approach. We basically bought the entire kit from the uh, shared resources uh, from multiple uh, institutes and platforms. We just did this high volume, high titer screening through the wild type mice, CFA7 BL6 mice, standard mice. And a lot of the traditional AAVs that people use for the retina studies obviously did not have this penetrance, did not pass the retina blood barrier. And a lot of this highly advertised uh, therapeutic um, things work efficiently and does offer a trans vascular neuron labeling very efficiently. And this is two different spectrum where nothing works or work too efficiently. We accidentally uh, walk in this domain where there's another uh, stereotype of the AAV, which is only seven amino acids away from this wild type AAV too. This is like the most original AAV. By changing the capsid for seven amino acids, this totally changed the transvascular properties and labeling efficiency. So it does label a very small subset of neurons compared with its efficient labeling, it labeled the neurons, and also label the endothelial cells, which is the original purpose of this engineering. And this is a very precious region uh, provided to us uh, during the COVID time uh, by uh, Dr. Kobe and Hamburg. We were very puzzled by the organization where not only the vessels, the endothelial cells are labeled, but very small set of subneurons in a very unique anatomical location also got labeled. Who are they and what they do? And that's the beginning of the journey. So when we zoom in, when we really look into the structure, yes, this AAVDR1 labels endothelial cells beautifully, which is also CD31 positive for those of you who study vessels. But it does label a small set of neurons in a very, very close proximity to the vessels. And this is somewhat counterintuitive, especially for those of you who read the textbook of a neurovascular interaction. So the general dogma is there's neurons, there's astrocytes, there's, uh, there's, there's uh, ve uh, vessels, right? There's also parasites and so on and so forth. And what's really the potential uh, anatomical link here that allow us to visualize a transvascular neuronal labeling and also for those of you who are like a, a neurobiologist, you immediately recognize this red stain. This is a very strong two bands of the acetylcholine stain uh, in, the, in the retina. They represent the uh, features of the retina. And we call it, uh, 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 is, uh, is that bright enough? Or is the, we, we need to dim this. Is it okay? You guys can see the brain? Okay. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in this, basically, this is really a subset of neurons we traditionally study called five stratified on and off the direction selected ganglion cells, right? So we'll come back to this. It, it, it sounds very stupid, it sounds very specialized, but there's a meaning for this. So basically, essentially the typical message is, is a very small subset, roughly one to 2% of the total ganglion cells that got labeled in this manner. And also they represent a the feature and they are not previously characterized because if you believe the dogma, all these neurons express a neuropeptide called CAR-PT. And our neurons labeled here is negative for CAR-PT. So by staring at these images, I already delivered three information. A, it's a unique neuron that sits at this very interesting branch point of the vessels. B, it maintained the feature. Three, it was not characterized. So, who are they and what they do? So essentially, it took me a, 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 a it took us a took Kenichi a long journey to uncover this. I'm gonna uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip all this. But for those of you who are interested in this, uh, we can talk more. Essentially, we took the published mouse single cell RNA seq approach. We focus on what's known and what's unknown. 
And the unknown part is by focusing on these subs and neurons, we look for whoever has these features uh, who was not annotated in the past. It turned out we were able to quickly narrow down to a few marker lines that label these neurons in the right manner. So again, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip all this, but feel free to check with me uh, later. Essentially, we converted the viral labeling to a genetic labeling, and that is mediated by a neuropeptide called neurotensin. For those of you who study the uh, visual dilation and visual constriction, uh, this is also very fascinating. I'm happy to talk with you who think about this on a daily basis, but this is a, a deep learning curve for me. Essentially, a neuropeptide called neurotensin is a marker to label the same type of neurons I described to you in vivo in the whole hormone setting. So for those of you who think about the beginning of the study, it's a virus labeling. And by converting the viruses to genetics, it offers an in vivo access, a repetitiveness of the approach, but also perturbations. By staring at these beautiful images, I think, I hope, like especially for those of you who think about this, this is not by randomness. Having a neuron selectively pop onto the vessels is not a given uh, randomness. And we did a lot of the interesting math to, to test about this. And also, we're going to show you more about it. But briefly, these neurons in a create-dependent manner, in a genetic manner, is indeed maintaining two different dendrites. It co-fasciculate co with a citicolic stain, which is a chat stain. And also, beyond that, if you zoom in a little bit, there is something interesting going on parasomatically that is really very, very busy and very, very unique. We never observed this structure in other ganglion cells we examined so far. You know, trust me, basically, we, our entire business in the past 10, 15 years as a field is to collect markers and drivers. And this, you can always argue, is M plus one, yet it offers unique features. So what do they look like? So in reality, we recovered a neuron in a critical manner that maintained all the anatomical structures. But the highlight here is, given any lattice optimization of the vessel standing in red here, this neuron sits at the right location where the, uh, the, the uh, penetrating vessels go in. You have a neuron that really sits here at the right location supporting the structure. Okay, Where there's a penetrating, this is sparse labeling, where we can offer you that view of one neuron supporting that structure. And you can imagine this so-called lattice optimization happening in a very high dimension at the range of a few thousand across the retina. So why do you care about this and why this is important? It turned out this is a unique type of neurons, you know, maybe the one of the first example in the entire central nervous system that offer this direct neurovascular interactions while this structure. So on the left is our star here called neurotensin. Remember the name of NTSRGCs. I'm going to change the name, just call it NTSRGCs. As a control, is all the random neurons you scan through. Yes, they are random. They form their own mosaic, but they do not observe the rules. They only follow the rules of within the 20 microns, but they don't have the selectivity. We focus on all these neurons we care about called neurotensins, but we really went deep in a create dependent manner. So by zooming in using live microscopy, we show you around 64% of the neurons share this structure at a branch point where the penetrating vessels go in. And they develop this parasomatic structure that is really wrapping around the endothelial cells and provide the structure support. And using a create dependent assistance of the EM, I wish uh, 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 Dr. Jones is here in the audience, but I can happy to, I'm happy to discuss all this in the EM setting. Essentially, by introducing uh, EM sensitive reagents in a create dependent manner into these neurons, we were able to reconstruct a direct contact from these pre positive neurons from a direct contact into the basement membrane of the vessels in a similar manner. And that it does not exist in other type of neurons. So, this essentially represents a unique structure that we, nobody has observed in the past. So, I would I've skipped a lot of the details of the video for the time sake, but essentially take my word. Essentially, we reconstructed many, many neurons across the entire library. And this is one out of many that we observed so far. Are there n equals to two, n equals to three? Well, it's still in that uh, 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 trajectory to discover more using different, different approaches. So 
so coming back a little bit, because this, given this audience here, especially uh, David and Ning, and also uh, uh, several of you who are like a physiologist here, uh, the, wh why does it matter? So we don't have the full answer yet, but what I want to show you is this one piece of evidence to add on top of this. So essentially we told you this is a bi-stratified on-off cells. So the light response tells you it is indeed responsive light on and off, but it also represents the very unique features of the direction, which is a temporal sensitive, uh, uh, temporal sensitive notion. So essentially, when you when you when the bar is moving from the nose to the temporal phase, this neuron starts to fire. And why is that? And how that translates to physiology and 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 psychophysics? We are still learning it. But the bottom line is. Among many of the ganglion cells people annotate so far, this particular direction was missing in the past over the years from Dr. Huberman, Dr. Roska, uh, Yin Jong Kim when she was with Dr. Josh Sainz. And over the years, basically, this particular direction was not genetically marked in the past. And we added one of the last piece of the puzzle to this direction. Essentially, given this orthogonal view of the direction selectivity, this is a unique feature that is distinctly different from the other three yet we use a genetic approach to market. But for those of you who are retina physiologists, that's another uh, uh, mystery here. So whenever I go across the bay and ask Dr. Malafeta at Berkeley, so how the hell, what the hell we missed this in the past? It's as simple as this, because physiologists hate to record a neuron next to vessels. Because to achieve a stable recording, it takes five minutes to deal with that vibration of the, 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 uh, the vascular flow. To achieve this recording, the physiologist has to spend a good minute to really hold it tight and deal with that uh, uh, fluctuation. And thus, this is, rep this is a big reason we missed in the past. Yet, it is a very unique piece of the puzzle that we finally find it uh, through this approach. And I'll come back to a lot of the speculation if you care, why this direction and why this location. Nonetheless, we come back to the development a little bit. This is the beginning of the conversation. So, why do we care about this? So basically, again, by looking at these pictures, uh, this is a, a citation from Jeremy Nathans. Uh, so basically, uh, you think about the x, y dimension of the, the VEGF, the efferent, the growth, and this is what we focus on. We focus on how the penetrating vessels reconstructing the deep layer and the middle layer. So by taking the genetic approach, I'm sorry, this may be very dim, but take my words, basically, the, this is a, 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 a pseudo-colored, basically superficial layer, middle layer, and deep layer, where we take a picture by doing a confocal scan. There's nothing fancy. Basically, at the adult age of P30, you scan many, 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 many scan uh, focal plans. You look into how they organize. This is really just a pen, so called penetrating zones where individual penetrating things organize like a lattice. By hitting these specific neurons we described to you in a paravascular manner, this growth really just got random. And by flating the control neurons I showed you in the past, which were also genetic control, it did not give the same phenotype. Essentially, in a cartoonish manner, individual penetrating vessels will just lose their directionality and lose their structural support. It leads to such a structural reorganization, remodeling in adult. So we were able to dial back all the way to the postnatal age of P10, where at P10, there's only superficial layer and the middle layer, I'm sorry, the deep layer, the middle layer hasn't been grown, and this phenotype persists. So this argue, this is not due to the remodeling of the structure, but rather the growth of the structure. So a neonatal ablation of this neuron specifically leads to this structure deficit that we're gonna dive, uh, dive further deep into why and how. So we come back to the neurons. We focus on these so-called NPS neurons. The existing and published database of the big data enable our small science in the following manner. By comparing this neuron that's infected versus neuron in the control cases, we zoom into the exi existing single cell database. We basically use a single cell RNA-seq database to predict what is enriched uh, in the control neurons versus this, this uh, NPS-specific neurons. So this is what I've been busy with in the past 15 years, basically understand the different coherence, different neuropeptides, and yet this cluster is totally different from the controls, where we have NTS, which I introduced to you, but also uh, 
very interesting molecule lighting up here called piezo 2 And for those of you who read the literature in the past 10 years, this is a very interesting and also very uh, uh, unique channel that is mechanosensitive. And this is really one of the mammalian uh, uh, central nervous. So this is a so this is a very rare case because for the entire central nervous system of mammals, piezo two is rarely expressed, and not to talk about piezo one, which is really in the periphery and also in the endothelial cells in the epithelial cells, but not in the central nervous system. There's a tiny, tiny amount of piezo two expression in the central nervous system which we really got our interest. And then given this audience, there is a also growing interest to study this in a glycoma setting. I'm looking forward to that discussion. But now this, our focus is on PS2 on development. <laughs> we were able to show you the same type of neurons called NTS neurons, indeed express PS2, but not PS1 during development. At the same age when this database was generated at P10, and not, also, not only the messages, but also the protein. When we take the published piezo 2 fusion protein from our Potin's lab, and lighten up the GAP fusion protein, it is really at the paravascular space uh, where the penetrating vessels grow into the third dimension. So this tiny structure, which is not super visible here, represents that penetrating vessels, which I'm trying to show you in the third dimension. Not only it matters for mouse, but also when we take the same messages from human, I had the discussion with the postdoc here, and we were very lucky to get it started, but we also collaborated with Arno uh, previously on campus, where we were able to get the end of the second trimester uh, allowed by the California law to study the piezo 2 uh, in the retina, piece, retina tissues, which showed that the piezo 2 indeed is expressed in this subset of neurons that's paravascular, but not in the distal locations. So these evidence together argue that these type of neurons is representing a very interesting mechanosensitive channel during development. And we decided to focus on, on this. And the rest of the story is actually getting very classic and very development oriented, where we took the genetic approach. Now, instead of talking viruses, Instead of talking ablation, we just basically let the uh, Madeira and God bless us for the 1, 6, 1 A's and 1 16. So basically, you know, when I look at that Maria Capacci's name, I just like tell me like the, the old school way still is the way to do it. Basically, all the, all the, basically all the traditional genetic crosses and all the knockings we generated here, essentially we introduced the PSO2 into the developing neurons, but not the other structures. We show you at the age of P10, this phenocopy, the ablation phenotype. When you do the same thing in endothelial cells, there's no such deficit. Okay, so again, blue is the superficial, deep is the deep layer, and this is the penetrating vessels. And this is really just take the stack mammon. And what we show you is, basically, sorry, it's a little bit reverse, but show you essentially is the, where the penetrating vessel grows inside is caused by the neuronal ion channel deficit, okay? So this is like counterintuitive in a way because it's non-intrinsic from the vessel perspective, but it is needed by some kind of mechanical sensing, which is we're trying to still figure out, right? So basically we're very blessed to, uh, uh, to be the neighbors of Dr. Yunong Jian, where he and his lab has been focused on mechanical sensitive sensation in a general setting. So our physiologist is trying to catch individual of this, try to understand uh, the, the, the real mechanical sensation uh, by learning from his people. Uh, this is still work in progress. I don't have the full mechanism yet rather than the genetic evidence. So then it's really the following piece of evidence to add, especially for those of you who are interested in piezo one. So we show you piezo one do not gain a copy that, and piezo one two double knockout does not gain additional phenotype. So essentially, at least in developing retina, focus on neurons, PSO1 is not relevant here. And we do not rule out the potential deficit of PSO1 in the later stage. And that is open discussion for the colleagues here today. So now when we focus on cell structure, we don't have to, again, I argue that we do not have the cellular, we do not have the medical mechanism, but we do have the cellular mechanism. By showing you, the conditional now called the 116s, basically we brought, we breed the cell type 
NPS specific in our account with a reporter, we show you by eliminating the PS2 specific in these neurons, you cannot copy what you observe in the general outcome. And this is very specific to the structure and as early as P8. So this is a P10, that day 10, this is P8. This is actually very fascinating in the following manner. Basically, the penetrating vessel first start to emerge. It's just basically like a little buzz. When you focus on the mutant, you see they totally lost their growth directionality. They, don't, they become this kinked and slanted structures. You do not know where to grow and how to grow it. I bet eventually the Tfa alpha, the VEGF, correct the gradients, and they still grow in, uh, to the inside. But the real physical touch represented here is being disrupted. So now when you further zoom in, I'm gonna skip other video for the time save, but what the piezo mutant mediate is the loss of the paradoxical interactions, the regression of the endothelial cell interactions that is happening between the control and the mutants. And this is a very high penetrance of uh, roughly 80% of the cells we scored. And this structure is about 50%. So essentially, we did not uncover the entire story. You, you can always argue what's the rest of 25%, what is the rest of 50%. But all I can argue is a cell type specific now called that is specific in interaction. <clears throat> so for those of you who are ophthalmologists and, and physicians, so you, you, you may come back to me to say, uh, is, a, is a, not only a how question, but also, uh, like, you know, why do I care? Because everything will be corrected. You still have the three structures. So I'd like to take a pause and really ask you, what do you think about this? Basically, why development biology matters to our understanding of the physiology? Yes, we have HIFA alpha. We have anti-VEGF, which is on your everyday practice. You can always get bring the, back the anti-VEGF to correct any structures you cared about. Why we care about this delicacy during development? You know, given the enriched, enriched understanding from the human genetics at this institution, from the Norris disease, and from the Norrin, where, you know, like all these is, uh, is, is remains largely unknown. Basically, why we care about this nitty gritty details that matters to physiology. I honestly do not have a full answer. I wish I can talk with some of the human genetics here. We can basically go back to some of this Norris or whatever that disease mutant collection to see whether there is a piezo 2 mutations. If you are interested, and if you have that knowledge, please talk with me. But here, we took the, uh, the, the genetic approach. We uncovered such specific interaction that was not represented here, but it does have a physiological impact, which I'm gonna show you. So I wanna admit that the past two years was a roller coaster for myself, for my junior laboratory, where we are very blessed to, uh, you know, be in the ophthalmology department, learn, interacting with other uh, ophthalmologists who are also interested in basic research, the interaction really enabled the following slides to happen. Okay, so I'm going to spend some time telling you about this. <clears throat> First of all, is why do you care? Does this really have adult implication and functional implication? So I was very blessed to be challenged by this question. So very luckily, a, a, a star a physician scientist, Tyson Kim join our department after his uh, postdoctor training, after his fellowship at Michigan. So he built this beautiful two photon in vivo imaging approach where there is a, a thinning of the uh, sclera and also the, the, the adaptation of the, the lens uh, from the side of the, uh, the eyes. Basically, the animals need to be anesthetized and we give the injection of the lectins. So it's, it's still very invasive. So you don't imagine this um, patients yet. But the bottom line is, we were able to, uh, to make a long story short, we, this is again, a skeletonized structure by deleting the middle layer to give you the visualization. All this happened at six months of age of the adult animals, or equals to five to 10 you know, in that range. For many, many genotypes, I'm gonna show you the representation here. On the left is our controls, heterozygous litter mate. On the right is the cell type specific mutants. So, by appreciating the lattice organization that ensure the oxygen nutrients from the, uh, the perfusion into the inner retina. So what we are struggling with is in the mutant is this super disorganized 
an unorganized vascular structure mediated by the neuronal specific ion channel deficit. Okay, it's as simple as this. Basically, one cell type, one ion channel. You know, come to talk with me if you know any mechanism. I'm still learning, trying to understand the, the cell cell interaction yet. So, nonetheless, we were able to recover this structural deficit. Thus, the immediate translation is at the same age, what happened to their um, entire uh, vascular flow? So we were very blessed to work with another two physician scientists at Stanford who has been investing on this in a different manners. I'm going to uh, use a very quick manner to introduce you what they find and what they worked with us. This was enabled by a, a, a very generous uh, uh, support from Glycoma Research Foundation uh, across a few institutions. And we were very blessed to work with uh, some of them. Basically, it's the same matter. Basically, it's live animals uh, with adaptation. A lot of you guys do this at FFA, where you inject, you observe for 20 minutes in a chase pulse manner. Essentially, the XY dimension of the perfusion still happen. Really, the, 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 the diving in, the, the perfusion into the inner retina, but significantly slowed down due to the structural deficit. This is the same age I described to you in the mature animals where everything is in vivo and with very high comp compound genetics comp comparison side by side, okay? So essentially what it does, as you can imagine, there's not enough perfusion. Thus, it leads to this uh, direct impact onto the inner retina with a functional implication. I'm gonna skip the, take my words, I'm gonna skip the statistics here by showing you the entire inner retina is being in a hypoxic state as early as three months and very significantly in six months time. Essentially, when you take the heat, famous heat from alpha stain, looking at the entire inner retina, but not outer retina, this is really just being super hypoxic. And that sustained hypoxia is, as we observe in any of the mutants, you guys probably think about in daily basis, the wind mutant, the phrasal four mutants, all the neural mutants, and so on and so forth. This, this essentially is as severe as that with the delicacy of the third dimension, not messing up the XY dimension of the superficial layer. So when we, uh, so this is a quite a, 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 a heroic effort and challenge by the reviewer say, well, after all this, what happened to the neurons? So again, we are very, uh, Kenichi is very persistent and also, you know, like really did a lot of work. Essentially, we were able to uncover this very interesting translation of the hypoxia back to the neurons. Essentially, over the long, longitudinal of 12 months, we see a significant decline in cell deaths. That happened toward the end of the one year old, that's the oldest we collected. So the hypoxia stays, feed back to the inner retina and start to kill the ganglion cells, but leaving the bipolar cells and endocrine cell intact. <clears throat> At the physiological level, we were able to use this very uh, interesting uh, thing we learned called pattern ERG, but not the general ERG, to show you that there is indeed a ganglion cell uh, deficit. Like this is uh, all in collaboration with Dr. Yang Hu's lab at Stanford uh, University. So now, last but not least, basically, why this is relevant to um, the potential disease models. By taking this knowledge, by understanding this, we understand this is actually very interesting for those of you who think about degeneration, think of the glaucoma. Essentially, we, we sensitize the neurons enough at a certain range. Now, uh, with the inspiration from the Stanford colleagues, we use this model called anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Essentially, is a, a, a photosporosis where you introduce this transient um, blocking and release. You challenge the system with the, a, a very short range, very low pressure ischemia. You observe what happened. So this is somewhat like the glaucoma model where you have this so-called two hit model. The first hit is our genetic deposition. The second hit is this hypoxia. Essentially, it's, it's this ischemia. Essentially, the AION sits by the mutants, essentially leads to the significant loss of the neurons, even as early as two to three months old. What we presented to you so far is a genetic predisposition together with a challenge from the hypoxia from ischemic, ischemic perspective that leads to such a deficit. Essentially, we went to visit, back, visit the structure and also the physiology show you that this tie back to three months of age and leads to a general deficit. 
what we told you so far is the neuron of mutants that leads to the neuronal susceptibility to the transient ischemic setting. So it comes from neurons to the vessel. We understand the vessel structures, the, the function, then feedback the neurons. That is our uh, full loop of demonstration in a phenotypical manner. <clears throat> so I think I uh, have covered most of the contents. And I, what I, if I may briefly summarize, essentially we uh, uncovered a structure that is really a unique pair of vascular neurons. Essentially, this is uh, representing a, a, a very unique structure that was not represented in the past, as I argue, because all the past uh, work focused on the VEGF, the efferents, all the classic literature you read from the endothelial cell development, where the gradients matters, the morphogens matters, where <clears throat> we started to focus on where the physical structure onto the third dimension started to e emerge during the second postnatal week, say P8 to P10. We call this brain structure the so-called penetrating vessels. We focus on how these very delicate interactions from a subset of neurons physically touch upon these vessels and provide such a structural support. We define these neurons genetically called uh, NTS neurons, also paravascular neurons. We render these neurons with uh, enough uh, structure manipulations, but also genetic manipulations. We show you when this structure is organized, they do grow inside and provide a very stereotypical uh, three-dimensional vascular lattice organization. We call this lattice. And there's a few debate on this structure. We decided to use this term, and people look looks like a reviewer that happy with this term, because initially there was a scaffold and people didn't like it because somehow the scaffold means a little bit more different structure, I guess. We call this, now we call the vascular lattice in 3D. We show you by eliminating these neurons or by deleting the PSO2, specifically in these neurons, there is a loss of the interactions disrupting the penetrating vessels, eventually leads to disrupting the three-dimensional lattice structures. And these have not only a structure deficit, but also a progressive RGC loss, enhanced susceptibility to ischemic conditions, and also more importantly for the vessels, people couldn't remember, this is an interesting mutant where you can evaluate the capillary perfusions. So the ongoing effort is really trying to understand what happened between the cells. What are the known and unknown ligand like receptors that is mediating the cells interactions? For that, we have taken a different approach, trying to enrich not only the neurons, but also the penetrating vessels using the single cell RNA-seq, using the uh, spatial transcriptome approach, and try to take advantage of the known and unknowns and try to marry the things together. Essentially, what we're asking is, what is really potentially on the penetrating vessel specifically, and what is really enriching the neurons? What could be the things on the membrane that mediate such interactions even transiently during development? And that is the ongoing effort led by Kenichi. And all those are coming out uh, uh, in, the, in the next uh, few months. And then I would like to share this uh, you know, unpublished work with you and invite you for other discussions. And last but not least, uh, if I may take the last minute to tell you the last data slide, this is not only important for the retina, Taking the discovery here, we are interested in the rest of the brain. So we were able to uncover same manner piezo 2 enriched paravascular cerebellum neurons. You know, you, if you ask how many piezo 2 neurons in the entire central nervous system, not many. There is three locations, and this is the second location. During development, these perivascular cerebellum granular cells also get lightened up in a similar manner. Who are they and what they do? This represents roughly 5% of a very small subset of granule cells, you know, not talking the entire cerebellum. However, for those of you who remember the Friso 4 work, the Norris disease here, you know, that, that was an initial contribution, including the, 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 the human genetics work down here at Utah. Basically, the Friso 4 Norris disease has two major deficit, two major areas of deficit. One is retina and why is cerebellum in terms of their vascular deficit. So what make the retina, in the retina, 
in cerebellum so unique that's different from the rest of the cerebral cortex, right? You know, people can went on and on saying this is phrase of four, that's win seven A, and this is, you know, gnawing, the other is different like a GPR 179, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of speculation. So I think we accidentally walked in this domain from a neuroscience perspective, but I think the, the, the insight here is beyond the two dimensional structure, how much of fundamental mechanism we're uncovering using this unique approach and how does that integrate to the rest of the knowledge? And that is our ongoing effort led by Kenichi Tama. And hopefully he can further explore in his own laboratory uh, when he becomes established and independent. Okay, uh, this is Kenichi and this is the lab. And uh, we were <laughs> very blessed uh, to have this work led by Kenichi and collaborated with people within the laboratory. And this is a close collaboration with many colleagues including a scientist called Xin Yi, who was trained by Jeremy Nathans, now working at Genentech, who contributed the original Frizo 4 Norris work. And we were very blessed to collaborate with her to get this going, because from our perspective, we don't know anything about the vessels. And all the rest of the team who are in the Bay Area and also globally, and we are really pushing this direction in a very multi-dimensional manner. And last but not least, this was really enabled by the uh, uh, many foundations, particularly uh, um, the NEI, and also very generous donation locally uh, through Glycoma Research Foundation uh, by the team of Catalyst for Cure, uh, uh, that is a, a large consulting going on in many years, that um, we uh, present a little bit of work at the very beginning, but this work is unpublished, also part of the team effort. Okay, thank you all. <clears throat> Have PPO2 mutants been found post-mortem in human glaucoma patients? Yeah, I think there's ongoing work at an institution uh, talking about this. So I think there, if I if I if I uh, can you know make a very general speculation on this, there's more knowledge somehow on PSO1 than PSO2, and also the knowledge on PSO1 per se, because there's there are the you know, the, 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 the what are called, it's not homolog, it is homolog, it's homolog, not homolog, whatever the, the word is, right? The, the, the two ion channels uh, in the mammalian world. There's more knowledge on PSO1 than PSO2. And also there's more PSO1 in the anterior chamber than the neural tissues. So my argument based on what we learned here so far is PSO2 is expressed transiently during development. It is what the development of deposition that renders the system. And what we showed is a little bit surprising, but this is the beginning of it. So the human genetics versus this, you know, reductionist approach of, you know, traditional mouse genetics hasn't quite married, but I'm looking forward to that discussion. Yeah. But, but so far, no. Is what you're PSO1, saying. I think there's more. If two, you really, but two, it's I not. I haven't seen enough, but I'm looking to whoever here that probably knows a little bit better than me. Yeah. Yeah. There's the question from the Yeah, okay, please. Yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting that the functional phenotype was relatively mild, even if you had very strong hypoxia. And I'm wondering if there is any compensation if you have choroidal perfusion and retinal perfusion, do you see any choroidal neovascularization or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then interestingly, there are some animals like rabbits who don't have the <laughs> perfusion at all and they can still see. have a slide. So, so, if I may take your question. So, essentially, this is the, this is the answer. So, basically, if I may um, take one step forward from your question. So, essentially, what he is trying to argue is most of people focus on when you say mild versus major phenotype. The major phenotype for vascular biologists is really disruption of the migration. All the VEGF, all the efferent, Dave Anderson, 
all the determinants of phrase of wind. It's all about the X, Y. So when you say this is a mild phenotype because people has not established approach to look in a certain dimension, right? There is some ongoing work from a few groups, including some of the collaborator work, um, Jeff Goldberg, when he was at UCSD, trying to play different interneurons to look into this dimension. Not much going on. I argue that this is not a mild phenotype in that dimension because this is the first as kind. People just didn't have the approach to observe. That's a uh, pushback to that. But now coming back to your question of- I mean, you have strong maybe vascular phenotype, but then when you look at the ganglion cell function, even in very old mice, I think it was still relatively good if I understood correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's a party, that's a party thing. That's exactly what this AI only is about, right? So basically, So, 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 if, if, if I may take your question here, for those of you who think about this, uh, what friends is it, it, trying to argue, or trying to, 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 to debate here is whether this is considered mild deficit given so long, right? But I would counter argue that, you know, all the reason for all the efforts do not even have this. So when you see a mild phenotype, this is not mild because our ganglion cells is exposed to high amount of oxygens and nutrients. And the entire inner retina and the photoreceptors in this mutant looks largely okay. So coming back to the choroid vascular question is because this, all the creeds we deal with do not perturb the, the outer vessel. So we do not have uh, perturbations. And at least the whole month view, we didn't see deficits. So, you know, because Tyson's camera can see the entire thing, we did have that as a control. Okay. So, the, the best implementation of this, the reason we introduced AI01 was because of that argument. So, what makes the system different is when we certify the system now, at the young age, when they estimate company, they become sensitive. So, the concept of your question is basically, this may be a, a, a interesting genetic model allows to look into things more delicate, more sensitive. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah, we have to finish up. Okay, great. Yeah. We will see you at noon. Okay, thank you.